بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفطر الصلاة وأتم التسليم على سيدنا ومولانا محمد الصادق الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد الفاتح لما أغرق والخاتم لما سبق ناصر الحق بالحق والهادي إلى صراطك المستقيم وعلى آله حق قدره ومقداره العظيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم أورثنا علما وفهما يا كاشف المشكلات يا عالم الخفيات اكشف لنا الحجوب عن وجوه هذه المعاني حتى نطلع على هذه المسائل واحفظنا من الخطأ والنسيان يا ربي أنت الموفق وأنت على كل شيء قدير أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Alhamdulillah, wa shukrulillah, we thank Allah Ta'ala for enabling us to gather with the intention of engaging in mudarasa of the Qur'an al-Kareem. As the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, that no people gather in one of the houses of Allah for the tilawa, the recitation of the Qur'an, and the mudarasa, which is the mutual study of the Qur'an, except that they are covered, they're enveloped by mercy, and the angels descend upon them, and Sakina descends upon them. And so we thank Allah for giving us that opportunity to be among the people of Mudarasa. And that's a really important word to use to set the tone for this program. Mudarasa doesn't mean one person teaching and the other person receiving. Mudarasa literally means the mutual study of the Qur'an. When you use mudarasa, it's on the pattern of mufa'ala in Arabic. And in Arabic, when you use fa'ala, uh, it takes the meaning of musharaka, of partnership. So they're, you're doing it together. Even if there's a person who's leading that initiative or imparting it primarily, it's still shared. It's still a shared experience where, where all parties are engaged in the study of the Qur'an, alhamdulillah. And studying the Qur'an is essentially embarking on an ocean, a shoreless ocean uh, that is so deep that you can never plumb its fullest depths. And you can never e extract all of its jewels and gems. And the challenge we have therefore, is selecting what part of the Qur'an to study first. Uh, we, if we began with just Surah Al-Fatiha, we could continue on and on and on for thousands of years. And this is a reality. Now, we chose to go over Surah Yusuf, the chapter, chapter 12 in the Qur'an, on the story of Sayyidina Yusuf, because it is a story, it's a narrative, and it's usually easier to follow along with a narrative than it is to follow something that may be more abstract or that may touch on legal rulings. Even though we'll look at legal rulings in Surat Yusuf, uh, Surat Yusuf is the quintessential story within the Quran. And as we approach the study of Surat Yusuf, we want to study it with a knowledge of what it means to study, to study the Qur'an and how to study the Qur'an and the sciences of the Qur'an and particularly the science of tafsir. So for the two, first two weeks, we probably won't even open the Mus'haf and read the beginning of Surah Yusuf. It's going to take us a couple of weeks because we have to get our bearings. مَنْ لَمْ يُتْقِنَ الْأُصُولِ حُرِّمَ الْوُصُولِ the scholars say that whoever doesn't master the foundations will be barred from arriving at the destination. Meaning, if you want to approach tafsir properly, whether it's studying Surah Yusuf or any other chapter, you have to know a little bit about the sciences of the Qur'an, the objectives of the Qur'an, and particularly the science of tafsir and how it works. Because not everyone who gets on a microphone and talks about the Qur'an is doing tafsir. A lot of times people suggest tafsir that is so far-fetched, they actually endanger themselves and others. 
as the Prophet Sallallahu said in the hadith related by Imam, Imam Al-Tirmidhi, whoever uh, speaks about the Qur'an from his ra'i, his uneducated opinion, فَلْيَتَبَوَّغْ مَقْعَدَهُ مِنَ النَّارِ Let him take his seat in the hellfire. It's very dangerous. So we want to approach this in a very methodical, careful way. So for the first two weeks, we're going to look at some muqaddimat, some introductory matters as it pertains to the study of the Qur'an. Today our objective is to cover two things only. Number one, the maqasid of the Qur'an, the overarching objectives of the Qur'an. And number two, the ten foundations that we have to understand when we approach the science of tafsir. If you've been in the Aqidah class, uh, sisters, you've covered this in the, la in the, the last class, Al-Mabari Al-Ashara. So the science of tafsir is one of several sciences of the Qur'an. We call them Ulum Al-Qur'an. And there are many great works that have been written by our Imams, such as Imam Al-Zarkashi, such as Imam Suyuti, and others where they detailed what we call Ulum Al-Qur'an, the sciences of the Qur'an. Among those sciences, <coughs> Tafsir is one of them. What we call Tafsir or Qur'anic exegesis or commentary is one of the essential sciences of the sciences of Islam. When we study Islam uh, in a formal setting, we learn that uh, among the different uloom of Islam, there are certain uloom that are primary and foundational and sought in and of themselves. And then there are sciences that are studied because you need to learn them, but in and of themselves, they're just means to an end. They're just a way to have a deeper understanding. We call the first uloom al-ghayat, the sciences that are a ghaya, they're an objective unto themselves. And then you have the ulum that are ulum al-alat. They're the tools of learning, things that you have to know in order to approach the objective sciences. And these all together form the ulum of Islam that we study when we go to a madrasa or we study with a shaykh and, or, and so on and so forth. A real simple example. The imams mentioned that the core sciences of Islam that we study for their own sake, revolve around three things. The science regarding our belief, our faith, our aqidah, usul al-deen. The second pertains to ahkam, the rulings, the halal and the haram, the acts of worship and rituals and the transactions that we engage in. And the third is tazkiyah, is spiritual purification. Ihsan. These are the three core sciences that we study. What are the sciences that teach these three things? Well, there are several, and those sciences are the sciences we seek for their own sake, such as aqidah, such as fiqh, such as the meaning of the hadith, such as tafsir of Quran. And then you have the other sciences which you have to learn them, they're absolutely essential, but they're not studied for their own sake. They're studied for the sake of understanding the core sciences. We call these the ulum al-ala, or the science of tools, or the ancillary disciplines. And they are the sciences of language, grammar, nahu, morphology, sarf, uh, rhetoric, balagha or bayan, Usul uh, al-fiqh, the science of hadith nomenclature. These are very detailed sciences that we cannot dispense of to understand the revelation of the Qur'an in the Sunnah. Because without those tools, you can't understand the meanings of Qur'an, the meanings of the Sunnah. And without understanding the meanings of the Qur'an and the Sunnah, you have no access to understanding what you believe, what you're supposed to do and not do, and how you're supposed to purify yourself and prepare for meeting your Lord. So these are the sciences in a nutshell. Tafsir is a core science. 
However, it is also one of the most demanding, if not the most demanding science of the sciences of Islam. Usually in the madrasa setting, tafsir is one of the last things you're going to study, uh, one of the last things a person will attend to, because really to approach tafsir in a traditional setting, you're studying a, a classical tafsir book. Depending on the school you're studying at, that could be the tafsir al-Baydawi, it could be the Jalalain, depending on the level you're at. And these works are the culmination of all of those other sciences that you've been studying. When you approach Tafsir al-Baydawi, you have to know your Arabic grammar, you have to know your sarf, you have to know your balagha, you have to know logic, you have to know rhetoric, you have to know all of these other ulum in order to appreciate what's being said. But for our purposes, we're not going to be going through all of those sciences. We're just trying to look at the basic meanings and the moral lessons and reflections on the Qur'an. So it's tafsir as well as tadabbur. It's explanation of the meanings as well as an invitation to reflect on the Qur'an, to consider the meanings of these ayat in the story of Sayyidina Yusuf and how they apply to us and how they apply to the world around us. So the Qur'an is the foundation and it is the primary source of knowledge for all Muslims as it is Kalamullah subhanahu wa ta'ala it is divine revelation revealed upon the blessed heart of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam every single thing is contained in the Qur'an whether it is contained explicitly or implicitly Allah ta'ala tells us that everything is contained within the Qur'an he says, I have, we have not left anything out of the book. Now, the specifics of our daily life may not be mentioned directly in the Qur'an, but general principles about those things are mentioned in the Qur'an. Therefore, everything is mentioned implicitly or explicitly in the Qur'an. Therefore, any person who is going to be a, a, a scholar of Islamic sciences has to have some measure of knowledge regarding tafsir. So today we said, uh, as we're getting our bearings in journeying into the meanings of Surah Yusuf, we want to look at two things. Number one, what are the objectives of the Qur'an? And number two, what are the foundations of the science of tafsir? So really two things. The first is the maqasid. This word is used a lot. People have heard it a lot in English speaking lands. It's kind of one of our Islamic vocabulary words. We know of maqasid sharia, the overarching object objectives of the sacred law. So the maqasid of the Quran, according to Imam Ibn Juzay al Kalbi and others, revolve around four major points, four major themes. They are instruction guidance, inimitability, known as i'jaz, and legal rulings. And from each of these four objectives come multiple branches and sub-branches and branches from those branches, making this shoreless ocean, bahrun la sahila lahu. That's by looking at all of the myriad sciences and reducing them to these four objectives we see the maqasid of the Qur'an. So let's look a little bit at these. And that's here on the board, for those of you who are taking notes. The first is instruction. And briefly, instruction here means instruction about matters of belief and matters about our purpose on, on earth and our understanding of reality. So theology, we see in the Qur'an, Allah Ta'ala is providing proofs for Allah Ta'ala's existence. He teaches His divine attributes, His divine perfection. He teaches us the purpose of our creation and teaches us about the relationship we have as human beings with Him Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala. The Qur'an also teaches us prophetology, who are the prophets, who are the messengers, transmitted beliefs as well, the things that we have no access to uh, within, uh, outside of the human intellect, such as belief in the unseen realities, belief in the ghaib, belief in the angels, 
belief in the realities that occur after death, in the barzakh, in the hereafter, in Jannah, in Jahannam. Also, we see in that instruction uh, within the Qur'an calls against uh, idol worship, shirk, superstition, polytheism, and things of that nature. The other kind of instruction we see in the Qur'an is instruction that clarifies our reason for being here as human beings on earth. Instruction that teaches us the overall framework for how we understand reality itself. Some people call these cognitive frames. If you have glasses, they have frames. And depending on the color of the lenses, you'll see things either red if you have red lenses or tinted if they're sunglasses. Likewise, cognitive frames are the way that reality is described to you. What is your world view? How do you see the world as a believer in Allah Ta'ala? That kind of instruction is imparted in the Quran, the cognitive model or the cognitive frames. The second maqsad, the second objective among the objectives of the Quran is imparting guidance. And here it's a little different from the first because this is speaking about the various ways Allah Ta'ala proves a point to us or how He refutes a false understanding held by people. This speaks about the way Allah Ta'ala encourages us or discourages us from certain things, giving us guidance about where we should go and where we should not go. So we see this reflected in uh, the divine promises and divine threats. Al-wa'ad wal-wa'id. We see in the Qur'an throughout the book, Allah Ta'ala mentions His promises for those who fulfill their purpose on earth and who obey Allah Ta'ala and His Messenger. And we also see the wa'id, the divine threat for those who go against that purpose, who object to Allah Ta'ala and His Messenger, who disobey Allah Ta'ala and His Messenger. These two always go together, al-wa'ad wal-wa'id. You will not find the wa'ad, the divine threat by itself, except that the wa'id, the, the divine promise, except that the wa'id will be nearby and vice versa. And Allah Ta'ala has told Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to use the divine speech, the Qur'an, to remind people who are wary of the divine threat. وَذَكِّرْ بِالْقُرْآنِ مَنْ يَخَافُ وَعِيد. In the last verse of Surah Qaf, Allah says, and remind with the Qur'an those who are fearful of the divine threat. So wa'ad and wa'id are a part of this Qur'anic guidance. We also see that a part of the Qur'anic guidance is at-targhib wa tarheeb which is similar to wa'ad and wa'id. Targhib is encouragement, to give you the raghba, this desire and drive to do good things. Like fada'il, the, the, something that inspires you to do what is good. And that is also paired with tarheeb, which is that which warns you and cautions you gives you a reason to be wary of doing what you shouldn't be doing. So Targhib and Tarheeb are also paired together in the Qur'anic guidance. We also see that a part of the guidance is invoking universal principles. And we're going to see some of those principles in Surah Yusuf. Universal principles, not moral guidance that pertains to one nation and not another, rather universal moral principles that apply for every single human being for all times. This is also a part of that guidance. And lastly, you'll see this in red on the dry erase board, stories, stories with timeless moral values and spiritual principles. Why is it in red? Does anyone want to guess why that's in red? Nothing else on that list is in red? Exactly. Because Surah Yusuf deals with this particular maqsad, this objective, from the maqasid of the Qur'an. Surah Yusuf is the quintessential story, the narrative in the Qur'an. So one of the ways of imparting guidance in the Qur'an is through the use of stories. And we're going to talk more about that 
when we get to the verse where Allah mentions that it's the most beautiful story. We're going to explore the way that stories themselves impart that guidance in more detail. But these are the different forms of guidance that we see broadly applied in the Qur'an al-Kareem. Uh, the third one is I'jaz. And I'jaz, I left it untranslated because though we can translate it, it's not the easiest concept to grasp in a single sitting. I'jaz means inimitability. That one is unable to imitate that thing. So I'jaz is something that can't be copied, it can't be imitated, it can't be replicated. And I'jaz, to understand the full meaning of it, requires a lot of unpacking, a lot of background knowledge in Arabic, in rhetoric, bayan, theology. But roughly speaking, the entire Qur'an is an inimitable miracle. It is a miracle that cannot be replicated, it cannot be copied. But what's of particular value to us in this context is that due to its inimitability, the meanings of the Qur'an and its timeless lessons transcend time and place. Meaning, the lessons of the Qur'an do not apply simply to Bedouin Arabs in Arabia 1,400 years ago. It's not limited to Arabs even, even though the Qur'an is revealed in Arabic which we'll be exploring when we get to the first part of Surah Yusuf where Allah Ta'ala mentions that He revealed it as an Arabic Qur'an. We, we need to explore this really important question. Why does Allah Ta'ala mention it as an Arabic Qur'an even though we can say the majority of Muslims don't speak Arabic? And the majority of the Arabic speaking Muslims don't have Arabic at a level sufficient enough to really grasp the depth of the, of the Qur'an. We'll explore that inshallah. But it transcends time and place, and that's a part of the i'jaz of the Qur'an Kareem. The fourth and final maqsad of the maqasid of the Qur'an is imparting legal rulings, ahkam. This means that Allah Ta'ala, through the revelation of the Qur'an, clarifies the rulings that apply to mukallafun, morally responsible people. It contains Councils, wasaya, it contains orders, commands, it contains prohibitions, things that we are forbidden from doing. It contains, what do we have here? Right, it contains different types of rulings, meaning legal rulings, the hukum shar'i, the, the legal ruling, what is obligatory, what is recommended, what is legally neutral and allowed what is disliked, what is haram, the ahkam al-khams. It also explains the halal and the haram broadly. It also explains the limits to the permissible. It also explains the stipulative rulings. Now stipulative rulings is similar to legal rulings. However, they pertain to what makes something uh, acceptable or unacceptable. What would spoil something and what would render it correct, what would be a condition, what would be an impediment, what would be a cause. These can be explored in more detail as we go into the sciences of Qur'an. The suha, fasad, sabab, sharut, mani' and these things. But these are the general uh, objectives of Qur'an as with regard to rulings. It also details the interactions that we have. Marriage, divorce, inheritance, business transactions, uh, uh, going into debt, recording debt, and so on and so forth. These are all forms of guidance because the human intellect cannot know what is morally good and morally bad without divine guidance. And that in itself can be explored in a lot of detail. We usually cover that in Aqidah because the, the unaided human intellect may find things that are pleasant to itself, things that they like, things that they dislike, but that does not establish a moral ruling. The moral rulings are established through revelation. And that's why the Qur'an came as a guidance, not just about matters of the unseen, but matters of the seen as well, and how we live. Now, so these are the four objectives of the Qur'an. Um, 
For our particular purposes, we're looking at the universal principles and these other objectives contained in Surah Yusuf. And before we can go into the tafsir of Surah Yusuf, we have to know what is tafsir in the first place. And tafsir, as I said earlier, it is one of the most challenging sciences. It is a challenge to learn it because you need to really know all of the other sciences to fully grasp it. And it requires proficiency in the core sciences and the ancillary sciences. Now, before we can go into tafsir of Surah Yusuf, again, we have to look at what tafsir is in the first place. In order to do that, we want to cover the 10 foundations that we cover with any science that we study. In the Aqidah class we had two weeks ago, we were covering these. And anytime we introduce a new science, we introduce these things. When you study a new science, whether it's fiqh or hadith sciences or tafsir or aqidah, you want to know what that science is and what it is not so that you can focus in on what you're studying. And to do that, we tend to introduce a, a line of poetry or a couple of lines of poetry that were penned by a famous grammarian and logician Ibn Sabban, rahmatullahi uh, alayhi. In, in these two couplets, he talks about what are the 10 things you need to know before you approach any particular science. So that by knowing them, you'll know what you're studying and what you're not studying, and you'll have a sense of purpose and scope to your learning. He says in this poem, إن مبادي كل فن عشرة الحد والموضوع ثم الثمرة ونسبة وفضله والواضع والاسم واستمداد وحكم الشارع مسائل والبعض بالبعض اكتفى ومن درج جميعا حاز الشرف. And the meaning of this poem is as follows: the foundations of every science are ten: the definition, the subject matter. The fruit, the relation, the virtue, the founder, the name, the sources, the ruling of the lawgiver concerning that science, and miscellaneous issues. Then he concludes by saying, and some of these 10 will suffice from the rest. I mean, you don't have to know all 10, but some are more important than others. But whosoever grasps them all, has a sharafa, they will attain unto nobility. So before we look at each of them individually, just give a very brief breakdown about what they each mean. And this is a good way of quizzing yourself, you know, ask yourself, what is the had? What is the mawdu'? What is the thamara? And so on. The definition of the science, of any science, is uh, establishing what distinguishes it from other sciences. A ta'rifu bil mahiya. Right, what makes it what it is? What establishes its essential identity that sets it apart from others? Right? The subject matter is what is the area of study? What exactly is it about? And so on. The fruit is the benefit you seek to acquire from it. And the ulama say that it's not appropriate to busy yourself with something that is fruitless. And by knowing the fruits, you will be motivated to study it. You have more focus in seeking those fruits and you'll have clarity about what you're supposed to get out of it. It's a way of knowing, am I really gaining those fruits as I study it? That's number four. Oh, number three. Number four is the nisba, the relation which is how does this science relate to other sciences? How important is this science in comparison to other sciences? The fifth one is the fadl, the virtue. What are the virtues of studying this science? What are the rewards in store for the one who studies this science in this life and the next? What can one hope to obtain? And then we have al-wadi', the founder. Who, who started the science? Who began this as a field of study? 
And then we come to name, the ism. What's the name or names given to this science? Is there one name? Are there many names? Um, and so on. And then we have uh, the istimdad. The istimdad is the source. Al-masadir allati istasqa minha. The, the sources from which this science derives its meaning. What are the sources from which it draws its foundation? And then we have hukm al-shari' which is the ruling of the lawgiver. What is the ruling on learning this science? Is it obligatory? Is it haram? <laughs> is it wajib? Is it fard kifaya, a communal obligation? Or is it a uh, fard ain? Is it individually obligatory? How much is required to know for the obligation to be lifted off of us? That's what we explore when we look at hukm al-shari' And then lastly, masail, which is basically what it talks about. You know, what's the gist of the science? What are some of the issues covered in it? And so on. Tayyip. So going from the beginning, again, looking at the definition, working our way down, let's apply those 10 foundations to the science of tafsir. The first is the had, the definition. And when we talk about the had or the definition, we always look at the linguistic meaning of the word as well as the technical meaning of the word. Because a lot of these words have dual meanings. A meaning in the Arabic language as it has been coined in Arabic and then a technical meaning for the word. A good example for this is salat. Salat in Arabic, in its original Arabic meaning, takes the meaning of dua. But the technical meaning in Sharia is an act of worship that is comprised of certain things one says and does, beginning with the takbir and ending with the taslim. We can't confuse those two, the linguistic meaning versus the shar'i or technical meaning. And this is why you have some Christians saying, oh, Muslims, you only pray five times a day. I pray all the time. Well, they mean is dua. We're not talking about dua, we're talking about salat as a technical shari term. So likewise here, uh, in Arabic, tafsir comes from fassara yufassiru tafsira. And fassar in Arabic means bayan wa kash wa idah. It means to clarify, it means to explain, it means to shed light on something, to make it clear. That's the meaning of tafsir. It's clarification and disclosure. That's the linguistic meaning. And you see that meaning in the technical meaning too. But there's a more specific definition when we look at tafsir as a science. Now as a science, as a technical term, is defined as a science that studies the meanings of the Quran, the dilala, what are the textual implications of the Quran, seeking to understand the meanings that are both qat'i and dhanni, that are both clear-cut and unequivocal, and those that are subject to interpretation within the limits of human ability. Within the limits of human ability. Because no one can claim that they have an exhaustive understanding of all of the meanings of the Qur'an. And we're going to look into that a little later, probably next week. Imam Suyuti in his Al-Itqan fi Ulum al-Qur'an, a book on the sciences of the Qur'an, he gives a different definition. And you see different definitions given, but they're all relatively close to one another. He says that tafsir is عِلْمُ نُزُولِ الْآيَاتِ وَشُؤُونِهَا وَأَقَاصِيسِهَا وَالْأَسْبَابِ النَّازِدَةِ فِيهَا ثُمَّ تَرْتِيبِ مَكِّيهَا وَمَدَنِيهَا وَمُحْكَمِهَا وَمُتَشَابِهِهَا وَنَاسِخِهَا وَمَنْسُوخِهَا وَخَاصِهَا وَعَامِهَا وَمُطَلَقِهَا وَمُقَيِّدِهَا وَمُجْمَلِهَا وَمُفَسِّرِهَا ومفسرها وحلالها وحلالها وحرامها ووعدها ووعيدها وأمرها ونهيها وعبرها وأمثالها. It's very long. So my, the definition I mentioned in English is much more abbreviated. He says it is the science that, that uh, seeks to understand the descent, the revelation of the Quran and its affairs and its narratives and the causes or circumstances behind its revelation and then the arrangement of the Meccan chapters and the Medinan chapters, the clear-cut passages and those that are not so clear-cut, 
the abrogated and the abrogating, the, uh, the, the, the qualified and the general, the absolute and the restricted, the, the uh, ambiguous and the unambiguous, the halal and the haram, the promises and the threats, the commands and the prohibitions, the counsels and the uh, metaphors or similitudes. There's a lot packed in there. So that's the definition of tafsir. Really, to explore the meanings of the Qur'an, both what is clear-cut and what is subject to interpretation according to the limits of our human ability. That's the definition. Now, what is the mawdur? We said the subject is, you know, what is it about? What is it talking about? And you see that already in the definition. The subject is the Qur'an, the Holy Qur'an, insofar as it explains how it is pronounced and the meanings it indicates, its individuated and its compound rulings. So, according to this understanding, tajweed could be included in tafsir. Others would say, well, no, tajweed is different from tafsir because you can understand tafsir without having knowledge of tajweed. Others say, no, tajweed here doesn't mean that you have the ability to pronounce it, but you at least know how it is pronounced. Maliki yawm din versus Maliki yawm din and so on. So that's the subject, the Qur'an al-Kareem. So the Qur'an, linguistically, we're going to go back to this linguistic versus technical meaning. The Qur'an linguistically comes from either Qarana, Qaf, Ra, Noon, which means to, to pair, to join, or to unify something. You know, a qarn is a horn. So you have two horns. You have, so qarana, to pair or to unify, which means that the Qur'an, according to this definition, linguistically, it is the essence of all divine revelation as it unites all of the universal meanings contained in the other subsequent, the other revelations revealed by Allah Ta'ala to the other prophets. That's one linguistic meaning. The other linguistic possibility is that it comes from qara'a, which is to recite. Now the technical definition of Qur'an is a lafz al-munazzal ala Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tahaddi It is the divine expression revealed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for the purpose of challenging opponents, demonstrating its inimitability. That's the definition of Qur'an. So what is the fruit? We know the definition now and what it's talking about, the subject. What's the fruit? What is the fa'ida al marjua bihi? What's the benefit that we hope to obtain from studying tafsir? Number one, understanding the meanings of Allah's speech. Number two, to protect ourselves from error in misunderstanding the Qur'an. To protect ourselves from misunderstanding the meanings of the Qur'an and to know the commands and prohibitions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are other fruits as well, such as knowing Allah's guidance in terms of beliefs, morals, acts of worship and interactions, character, dealings with community, and knowing the reality of this life and the reality of the next. These are all thamarat, fruits that we gain from studying the Qur'an. Then we come to virtue. The virtue of studying tafsir. The virtue is that by studying tafsir, you will have insight into all of the above, all the things that are in the fruits. You have insight into Allah's commands and prohibitions. You have insight in your purpose. You have insight about your Creator and about His prophets and the unseen realities. And through that, you will fulfill your purpose and you will gain high rewards in this life and the next. It is the most noblest of sciences because it pertains to the noblest of things, which is the divine attribute of kalam, the kalam Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, we are now at number... That's, uh, I think I skipped one, didn't I? Yeah, I skipped, okay. So I talked about the virtue, I skipped the relation, the nisbah. So again, the nisbah is the relationship between this science and other sciences. What is the relationship between tafsir and the other sciences 
of Sharia. The relationship is that the Quran or tafsir of the Quran is from the core sciences of Sharia. It's not the same as the science of grammar. You study grammar to understand the Quran. You don't study the Quran to understand grammar. Even though Quran is used to provide examples of sound grammar, grammar is used as a tool. Studying the Quran and understanding its meanings is sought in and of itself. It's from the ulum al-ghayat, the objective sciences that we seek uh, on for its own sake. So going to number six, we go to the founder. Who is the founder of this science? Anyone want to guess who the founder of the science of tafsir is? Ibn Abbas. Oh, someone said Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay. Uh, those are good answers and both of, both of them are right. When we talk about the founder of a science, of the science of Sharia, there's two ways we can understand the meaning of Wadir, founder. It either means the mustar, the source from which it derives, or it can mean the mudawin, the one who has organized it, structured it, and codified it. Depending on how you interpret that term, you'll get different answers. If you're asking about who was the source, the source is, it, from our human perspective, it is Sayyidina Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He received it by the wasita of Sayyidina Jibreel, who received it by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala as divine speech. It was placed into his blessed heart and he conveyed it to us. It, it, it is, he is the mustar in that sense because we only have access to the divine speech because of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam fa inna ma yassarnahu bi lisanika Allah says we have only made it easy by means of your blessed tongue were it not made easy by means of his blessed tongue we would have no access so he is the mustar in that regard he is also the one who clarified the meanings and the broad principles that guide us to those meanings However, as we look at tafsir as a more detailed science, we don't really use that as our answer. We would say that the founder refers to those people who received from the Prophet Wasallam or from those who received from him and who organized and structured the interpretation of the Quran until it developed into its own science. And that would be the Sahaba, particularly Ibn Abbas, and then other Sahaba, and then into the second generation, uh, other uh, among the Tabi'un, and then other Mujtahid Imams who gathered these sciences, gathered these interpretations and put them together. However, it's not so easy to answer this uh, because tafsir is not just transmission. You understand? Tafsir is not limited to simply saying that well, Ibn Abbas said this is what it means, end of the story. This is called tafsir bil ma'thur. Tafsir bil ma'thur is the tafsir that only represents what has been transmitted from the early Imams among the second generation, the third generation, and the Sahaba, or even the Prophet Sallallahu himself, what's been transmitted about the specific interpretations of the Quran. The issue here is that tafsir is not limited to that. In fact, there are any number of ayat that do not have a specific hadith that explains their meaning. So there's more to tafsir than that. But generally speaking, yes, they're the founders of the science. And anyone who came after them were drawing from their source. It, when you look in the early tafsir, you see a lot of it uh, hinges on the meanings of words. The meanings of certain phrases in the Quran and those phrases will be interpreted uh, based on the usage of the word in jahiliyyah. Which is why to understand the Qur'an on a deep level, you have to know jahili poetry. You have to know the pre-Islamic poetry, the meanings of the terms. This is why to this very day, if you study Arabic among the different sciences of Arabic, you will eventually study jahili poetry, uh, studying the Mu'allaqat al-Sab'ah or Mu'allaqat al-Ashar, the ten hanging odes that used to be hung on the Kaaba during their competitions. These are still studied today. Uh, 
and they have commentaries. And there's even larger Jahili poetry collections that are studied beyond those. And you know, in Mauritania, where I had a chance to study for some, for some time, the children would memorize the Quran and memorize over 6,000 lines of Jahili poetry. And what came out of that was what we would call yani, aqliyat al-Arab al-Awail, this kind of way of looking at reality as constructed by or as uh, demonstrated in the, the Arabic poetry of old. It, it's, it's really hard to explain how that, how that works, but when you immerse yourself in that ancient language, you come to understand not just the, the, the meanings of the words, but also the feelings they evoke. So it's a very deep science, uh, but it was founded by those individuals. Uh, moving on, we have name or names. Now, does this science have one name or many names? Some sciences have lots of names. Aqidah, for instance, has many names. The science of Aqidah, the science of Usul al-Din, Ilm al-Tawheed, Ilm al-Sunnah, Ilm al-Kalam, uh, all of these different names are used for the science of theology. Uh, for tafsir, there's only one name, and that's tafsir. You'll sometimes hear the word ta'wil being used, but that's not really the word used for the science as such. Imam al-Tabari will often use that word ta'wil, and he means the explanation. Ta'wiluha kada wa kada, meaning its interpretation is such and such, but the science is called the science of tafsir, that's the only name. The source or sources, istimdad, this, what, you know, where do you get this science from? What are the sources from which we derive our understanding of this? The sources are the Arabic language. Grammar, morphology, rhetoric, and so on, bayan. Also the sunnah. Also usul al-fiqh, usul al-deen, theology, qira'at, the different modes of reciting the Qur'an. These are all sources from which we derive our understanding of tafsir. And that's why you have to know these sciences before you can really engage in tafsir. It's one thing to read a tafsir and to study it personally. It's another thing to write your own tafsir. That's dangerous business. And one shouldn't do that until they've at least, I would say, put in at least a good solid 20, 30 years in those other ulum. Uh, because it's not an easy task by any means. Now, we go to the last two. The last two are the ruling and the issues. So we said the ruling is hukmu shari' fihi. What is the ruling of the shari' the lawgiver, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, concerning the learning of the science or the study of the science? The ruling is that it is individually obligatory. It's fardain for the person who has mastery of those ulum when they, there is a need in their community to know the meanings of the Qur'an. But for others, it's a communal obligation. And for our purposes, at the very minimum, we should know the tafsir of Surah Al-Fatiha and the tafsir of the, su the surahs that we recite regularly in our prayers. Not saying that's fard on any of us, but it is communally obligatory. If you're in a community and no one knows the meanings of the Qur'an, and has no access to that, something has to be done. Someone has to learn enough so that they can approach that, either gaining mastery or having enough mastery of the tools of learning where they can approach the books of tafsir and clarify the meanings to the people in their community, right? And lastly are the masail. Masail is basically, what are the issues? What are the miscellaneous issues explored? Well, we're going to see all of that when we get into the tafsir, insha'Allah. The meanings of the various ayat and uh, what they imply. So insha'Allah, we'll stop here today. Next week, we're going to look at basic uh, foundations for approaching the Qur'an and understanding the ayat. This sets the tone. This is really the bedrock, the foundation on which we build the rest of what we're going to be learning. Uh, after next week, will go directly into Surat Yusuf. So next week is still more uh, muqaddimat, um, introductory material for getting our 
uh, orient, orienting ourselves before we approach the tafsir, insha'Allah. Wallahu wa rasuluhu a'lam. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.